Thank you. So thanks very much, Bernadette. No pressure there. Yeah. <laughs> so I'll try and step back a little. What I wanted to do is to tell you a story, which is probably an appropriate thing to do with an audience like this. And my literacy story actually started like Bernadette in Ireland, um, where I taught for 12 years. I taught grades 7 to 12, and uh, tried to convince children of that age that Shakespeare and Milton were of relevance and of interest to them, uh, succeeded in some cases. Uh, and I just loved teaching. It, it became my life. And I've been very fortunate to have always worked in education. But I did get a, an interesting moment where I, I was approached four years ago and asked to move to uh, the United States from just outside Dublin with my wife and my six kids um, to take up a job uh, which has the grandiose title of Director of Worldwide Education Strategy. And I hadn't a clue what that meant. You know, I said yes, because it sounded great, and my kids even thought it was impressive. But I really wasn't sure what they meant. The worldwide bit I got. Um, the education bit, I kind of got as well, having a teaching background. And my six kids actually helped me get a bit of a grounding. I have children in kindergarten, elementary school, middle school, high school, and college. So I'm getting a good overview of the American education system as a result. <laughs> but the strategy part was really puzzling. You know, strategy is defined as a detailed plan aimed to deliver a long-term objective. But I wasn't quite sure what that objective was supposed to be, because we're a technology company. You know, Microsoft are not thought leaders in education. Uh, effectively, what we do is we build things. You know, we're, we're one of the world's most elaborate toolkits, if you like. But we have no clue what it is we're supposed to build. And trying to set a strategy for education for Microsoft without knowing what that objective would be was pretty much impossible. So what we did is we spent around nine months just listening, talking to organizations like uh, the leading NGOs, people like UNESCO, and trying to understand what it is that was most important in education and where it was that we felt that we could add value. And what quickly became apparent was there was one issue above all else, which was the foundation for all education, and that was literacy. Everybody was unanimous in this. They said, look, if you're going to do anything, if you're going to focus anywhere, please focus here, because this is an enormous challenge. It's not just the foundational challenge, but it's a challenge which affects one in every four adults on the planet. It's a challenge which affects youth, it affects boys and girls, and it's also keeping a lot of them out of school. So the fact that uh, the this, this 60 million girls that Anna mentioned earlier, of those, uh, th that number, 48% of them will never attend a single class. It's not just that they're out of school now, but the chance of going to school has actually passed them by. And there are other challenges there as well. Well, one of them being that many, in fact, around 31% as it is estimated, of those illiterate children are living in homes where there isn't another illiterate person, a literate person. Their parents are illiterate and their siblings are, illit are, are illiterate. What do you do in those circumstances? Giving a child living in an illiterate home a book is effectively uh, as useful as giving them a rock. It will make no difference. And there are major infrastructural challenges as well. We know that we don't have enough teachers. We don't have enough schools. We don't have enough materials. So how do we actually address a challenge like this? And what part can technology play? Well, some of the other learnings we had actually were about the dearth of content, particularly in minority languages. There are just over 7,000 languages on the planet. But one of those languages dies every two weeks. And one of the reasons for that is the absence of scaffolding materials for people to learn literacy in their first language as opposed to in universal languages. It's an area of particular interest and concern for UNESCO, given their cultural uh, remit as well as their educational remit. But at the same time, we're seeing a ubiquity of mobile devices. There are now more mobile phones on the planet than there are people. And that number is increasing all the time. I don't think anyone here believes seriously that pretty much everyone on the planet won't have some form of device within five to 10 years. Now, that suggested to us that perhaps literacy was an epidemic for which the vaccine was already in people's pockets. How could we harness that footprint, that opportunity to try and deliver literacy education? Well, the first thing we had to do was figure out if it made sense. So we engaged in some joint research with UNESCO to see whether actually it would be affordable to use mobile devices to help scaffold learning. And one of the things we discovered very quickly was it led to enormous cost savings. And actually, that's important. 
Because as a technology company, what we didn't want to do was to come along to UNESCO or others and say, we want you to spend more money than you're spending now in addressing literacy. What we wanted to be able to show was that technology can allow you to take that same money and reach more people with better outcomes. In fact, traditional methodologies are really expensive. Printing, storing, distributing books is expensive. But actually, the biggest expense is in managing personalized learning in doing individual assessments so that we know where people are on a personalized learning journey. And we can make interventions at appropriate times and direct them to the next piece of appropriate content. So at this stage, we kind of had some clarity. There were some things we could do. And there were some things we were asked to do. So we boiled it down to two challenges. One, could we help people to create, at no cost, an unlimited number of literacy learning texts in minority languages? And secondly, could we ensure that those texts could support learning in homes where there was not, an illiterate, where there was not a literate parent or peer? So it actually left us with another problem. We now had to take a risk. We had a limited amount of budget. Um, Microsoft Education pretty much gives away everything we have to education customers, so our budget isn't what you might expect. But we had to decide to place a bet. Is that what we do? Do we take our funds and put it all, because that's the way the technology industry works, you put all eggs in one basket. Do we say that we're going to concentrate on creating a service to allow people to create unlimited text in minority languages, and we're going to put that development money into creating some sort of service so that text could read themselves aloud on mobile devices? Now, that's a tough thing to do. But we made the decision. We think, OK, given all the guidance we've been given, this is the right place to focus. And we began to develop a set of tools. And we call those tools Chekhov. Um, yeah. The reason I did that is because uh, Chekhov is my favorite uh, short story writer, and it seemed most appropriate. Um, but what this allowed people to do was to go to a website and create a piece of, of text which incorporated text, images, either illustrations or photographs, and narrated audio. And those texts, in turn, would play themselves aloud on a mobile device. Because what we were trying to do was to recreate that essential co-viewing experience, where a child would sit on a parent's lap and learn to read, even if neither of them could read themselves. So at this stage, we thought we'd better trial it. So we chose uh, a country and an environment we thought which would be appropriate, which is Lesotho in southern Africa. And what we do is we flew down to Lesotho, and we trained uh, 700 teachers and provided them with low-cost devices like this, which would allow them to consume stories that they would create within the College of Education. And we invested a huge amount of money and a huge amount of time, and it was a dismal failure, absolute failure. Let me, let me explain just how much of a failure it was. Three weeks later, we were sitting back in Redmond in, in Washington State, waiting to see all the stories come through. So we trained 711 teachers. They all had devices. We were waiting to see these wonderful pieces of work coming through. And after three weeks, guess how many we had? Zero. Not one. We'd spent roughly half a million dollars on development. We'd gone all to the expense of traveling and training. And not a single text had been produced. Absolutely nothing. Uh, my boss wasn't very happy. So what we then decided to do is, well, OK, let's figure out why it failed. And we discovered quite quickly the reason for it. We'd been slightly misled. Um, we'd been told by the College of Education that all of the teachers had access to the PCs within the college so that they could create the stories. And then in turn, they would consume the stories on the mobile devices. It wasn't true. Uh, they were embarrassed to tell us that actually those PCs were restricted for use by staff. So none of the students ever got to the computer. Therefore, they never created a story. Therefore, they had no stories to deliver in education. Uh, not a good thing to discover. But one thing we also discovered, which was quite humbling, is it was actually our fault. We hadn't really been collaborating with our partner. What we'd done is we'd gone along, listened to their problem, and said, fine, we'll go and make a solution. But we hadn't deeply collaborated with them. We hadn't really worked side by side. And when we went back and started talking to people like UNESCO, we discovered that the literacy agenda had actually moved on in a very, very good way. Uh, the Sustainable Development Goals issued by UNESCO have now targeted literacy as one of the core challenges to be addressed. And that's a really good thing. It meant if we dealt more closely with organizations like that, we could create better solutions. One of the first things we did is we made it possible for people to create stories on a mobile phone as well as to consume them. And once we'd solved that problem, we quickly saw a lot of those stories coming through. Uh, every one of these stories being published both as a free print-on-demand resource, 
Every one of these stories available both online and offline, but every one of these stories also capable of reading itself aloud on a mobile device. In fact, Chekhov is now the largest single publisher of apps in our app store, which is quite a, an advance. But we realized we can't let things stay where they are. So we began to develop some other tools and work more closely inside the company. There's a new set of tools called OneNote Learning Tools. I don't know if many of you are familiar with OneNote. It's one of the Office products. But OneNote Learning Tools is, is remarkable for helping scaffold early grade learning, not just because it does simple things, but it does them quite sm in a smart way. One of the things it does is provide an immersive reader. So you can take any text, put it into OneNote, and it will read itself aloud to a beginning reader. But what it also allows you to do is to control the speed at which that narration is done. So if you have a child at a very early stage of fluency, the narration will read quite slowly and emphasize every word and syllable. And then as they progress, you can move that slider up and the narration will speed up and become much more naturalistic. It's a free set of tools. It's one of the things that now is part of a suite of 10 different literacy education tools that we've built. Those tools are now being used by over 3 million students worldwide. They're being used in over 100 countries. And the one thing we're absolutely certain of as we look forward is that we're going to fail. And we're going to fail, and we're going to fail gloriously, and we're going to fail repeatedly. And this is a good thing. This is a good thing. What we've learned in dealing with non-governmental organizations and with charities is actually there's a place where the two cultures meet. Now, typically, people that believe that's a meeting of an analog culture and a digital culture. The belief is that everybody working in an NGO works with print and paper and pen, and everyone who works in a place like where I work, sorry, um, works totally in bits and bytes, and we disdain paper. I'm a bibliophile. I'm an English teacher, so I just love, I collect first editions. So it's not entirely true. But actually, where the cultures clash or meet is actually around the concept of failure itself. Because if you work in a charity or an NGO, what you're terrified about is failing. Because ultimately, what you believe you're doing is you're spending other people's money. Most of the funds you have come through donations or memberships. And what you're terrified of doing is trying something that fails. Now, the result of that typically is one of two things. One is inertia. People try nothing new because the risk of failure is so great that they're afraid to try it all. And the second thing that happens is the same thing again. People look and say, well, what worked in the past? Let's try and do an iteration of that. Let's do much the same thing again, because we know that will be successful. Well, the reality is that nothing we've done to tackle global literacy has been successful. Nothing that's happened over the last 50 years. And the, the millennium goals set by UNESCO all failed, all six of them. There are actually more people on the planet who are illiterate now than in the year 2000. So we have to be able to risk and try something new. The reality is that failure is actually essential. It's not just inevitable, and trust me, it's, it's inevitable. But it's something we should embrace. In an industry like mine, we do this all the time. We recognize that the only way you come up with something new or something useful is that you try something and fail, and try and fail fast, and fail forward. You try and learn quickly from what you're doing, and then apply that learning as rapidly as you can so that you can make course corrections and improve things. You know, the history of Microsoft and Apple and Google and Facebook is littered with things we'd much rather you forgot about. We've tried a lot of things which crashed and burned and burnt up a huge amount of money in the process. But we understand as an industry that that's how you make progress. You have to risk. You have to be prepared to embrace failure as an essential learning experience. This is my favorite metaphor for literacy. Um, but it's also a really good metaphor for partnership. First of all, you can't get anywhere on your own, and you can't get anywhere without the right tools. Secondly, you may not know where you're going, but you've got to try that journey. The reality is there might be a drop on the other side. There might be somebody waiting to shoot you the minute you put your head above the parapet. I'm sure all of you are familiar with an environment like that. It may be that the, the gap is insurmountable. But unless you make an attempt, you're never going to succeed. If any of you are involved in projects or plans or programs within your own schools or school districts or regions, there's always a hesitance to start work in that way <coughs> and to bring others into it. The fear of failure is great. What I would say to you is don't fear it, embrace it. 
The reality is, if you tell people at the start, we're likely to fail. It may be that we'll get to the top of the ladder and discover that this is the wrong place, and we'll have to come all the way down again and move it. It may be that <clears throat> the drop is insurmountable wherever you go, but you have to take the risk. You have to regard failure as something that actually is just a necessary step towards success. It's a learning that we've helped to bring to our NGO partners, just as they have brought us direction. That's what I would see as a true partnership. We've been given direction by organizations like ILA to tell us where we need to focus and what the key issues are. What we often bring as a commercial company is an understanding of what is required to actually let you get there at scale. The other thing I would point out is that we could take the route of walking along that wall until we find an entrance. But the reality is literacy is a very urgent issue. We have to try new things. We all of us have to be prepared to fail if we're actually going to make progress. Thank you.